session will be on ecology. Uh, I'll introduce the chair. Uh, the chair for this session will be Mr. Kelly Nobu. Uh, Mr. Kelly Nobu is currently the director uh, at the National Land Commission Secretary to Bhutan. And uh, prior to this appointment, he has been uh, chief urban planner at Kimpu Municipality. Uh, Kimpu, by the way, is Bhutan's capital. And uh, he has, uh, Mr. Kalinabu has a master's uh, in urban and regional planning and uh, a bachelor's degree in architecture. Uh, he had also undergone a uh, one year special program on urban and regional planning at the MIT. Thank you. examine how we may attempt to understand and make sense of this vast field of ecology through the lens of Bhutan's experiences in the areas of building earthwork resilience, vertical farming and engagement with climate change. However, unfortunately, we do not have two other speakers here today, so we have plenty of time. Uh, therefore, I think we may have to narrow down our lens and look at this vast field of ecology through the lens of Bhutan's earthquake experience in resilience. So, uh, if I may, here is how this session is going to work. Uh, since we have uh, plenty of time, I think uh, you can take the liberty of making presentation for about 30 minutes. After that, we will take the question answers. And then, after we wrap up, you may choose to attend the uh, other session in the other hall. Uh, before I introduce the panel here, uh, I wish to thank you all for being with us this morning. Uh, we have uh, two of them here with us, uh, co-authors, experts and practitioners. So their bios are in the package. Uh, and I would not be spending so much time going into the detail. But uh, briefly, we have Mr. Fergus Lyon, who is the professor. No, he, he, we have uh, Fergus Lyon, right? Lyon, did I pronounce it correctly? The Fergus Lang is the professor of Middlesex University in uh, London and the deputy director of Centre for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity. He has numerous feathers on his cap, as is evidenced in his bio, and he also has over 130 publications. And then we have uh, Miss uh, Dr. Kinga Wangmo. Would you like to stand up, please, and show your face to the audience? Okay. Uh, Dr. Kinga Wangmo is the co-author of this paper, and she is the first Bhutanese archaeologist. She has an undergraduate degree from the Harvard University and a PG degree from Cambridge and Kirtland Institute of Art. She also holds a PhD from the Cambridge University. So. Shall we extend a warm welcome to the two of them? So, uh, this the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I, I prepared some slides for about fifteen minutes, so I don't think we'll quite reach the thirty minutes. Okay, <laughs> glad to hear. Um, but what I want to talk about is this crucial topic about the sort of resilience to earthquakes. Bhutan being in, a, in the Himalayas, 
in a zone where there have been a lot of earthquakes. But what does it mean for Bhutan in a country which actually hasn't had a very severe earthquake uh, for, uh, for many, many years or in, in much of uh, living history? And to tackle this issue, uh, a team of people came together uh, from different disciplines. And so that's why I'm going to talk a particular element of it based on some of the work that a group of social scientists, myself, uh, Francis Harris, who can't be here today, um, uh, and Congo Wangwo, uh, who are looking at how do people perceive um, earthquakes. And particularly when you're dealing with uncertainty, and something about earthquakes is that you, know, you don't know when it's going to happen or the scale or, or the issue. How can you actually make decisions when there's such uncertainty? And how do, so we're looking at this, how all sorts of different people in the country, whether it's policy makers, it's people in business, uh, in communities, in the monastic body, how do they all look at uh, making decisions uh, related to uh, being resilient to earthquakes? We're going to focus particularly on that, the preparedness for um, earthquakes. There's quite a lot of work that's been done on disaster management in that period of 72 hours after an earthquake. And I think we found that there's, because there's been a lot of attention there, we wanted to look actually what can be done in the sort of building up the preparedness in terms of the resilience of buildings, but also looking at the longer term resilience after an earthquake as well, What's, what, what might happen there. So that was the focus of, of, uh, of our research. And we wanted to do that by recognising that there's no one way of understanding this problem. We've got to have the scientific understanding, we've got to have the understanding of policy makers, and also the understanding of, uh, uh, of a whole range of other people in the, in the, in the country. Um, so this is a project we called a Brace Building Bhutanese Resilience to Cataclysmic Events. Um, funded by the uh, UK government, the Global Challenges Research Fund, and its aim through these different funders, bringing together social science, <coughs> natural scientists, and also arts and humanity uh, researchers as well together, to really bring together new relationships around Bhutanese researchers. And in this way, it's quite uh, we're very glad to be here at the uh, this inaugural meeting of the uh, 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 that's happening here, bringing together different disciplines because it is about how do we make links between the Bhutanese researchers and uh, scientists from elsewhere, and also how do we cut across the boundaries between different disciplines as well. So it's not, yes, it's, it's a number of different disciplines that we've got, also expertise, also bringing together practitioners and policy makers, and so this is an important part of our work. And one of the things we're leading to is this idea of a getting a better assessment of that uh, called a probabilistic seismic hazard assessment. And this is working with uh, a whole range of um, uh, people to get this better understanding of what does resilience mean. And so for this, we had with the uh, project was actually led by um, uh, 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 University of Bristol in the UK, but in Bhutan it was led by Dautra Drukpa uh, in the Department of Geology and Mines, uh, who's a seismologist uh, in Bhutan. Uh, there's also uh, Raju Saka, who's an engineer at RUB, uh, Kunga Wangmo, uh, looking at the archaeological aspects. And what we wanted, and also uh, Karma Funso, looking at historical aspects. And so this brings together this idea within the project that to understand what we're doing, what's happening in Bhutan, we need to know from all of these different perspectives. So not only is it the, the seismology, that there's a, uh, a growing amount of data on uh, on the seismic record there, but also we found that that wasn't enough because it only goes back a certain length of time uh, and some of the older earthquake episodes weren't recorded in the scientific data and so therefore we're relying on historical records and so working with Karma um, Furuto, looking at some of the uh, archives, we've got, gone back and actually got a much better idea of earthquakes in Bhutan, linking this historical with the scientific. And again, maybe Kunga can talk a bit later as well about some of her work on how the archaeological record may also in the future shed light on the history of earthquakes in Bhutan as well. So we need to piece together all sorts of different areas. Then it's very important of working with engineers. How do we have, what sort of engineering do we want? 
and also what sort of, uh, not only for houses, uh, of, um, for offices, but also for historical buildings as well. So again, bringing the historical element back with the scientific as well. And then also the work looking at resilience is all about behaviour, it's about the social uh, and cultural aspects as well. So for that, we needed to understand how do different people understand what's their behaviour, what's their perception of risk. And some of that relates to their day-to-day -to -day decisions, uh, and some of it relates to their belief structures as well. And uh, so therefore, we did a bit of work looking um, at how um, the monastic body uh, and uh, religious texts relate to the ideas of earthquakes. And then that, again, how does that shape behaviour uh, and, and decision-making? So the project, is, it's, it's a work uh, that's just, the first stage of it is just finished. It was an initial uh, sort of 18-month uh, project that was aiming to bring together this team to see where the work could go in the future. But we've done quite a lot of work developing the maps, the hazard maps. Also a number of different papers. We've had uh, two workshops in Bhutan, bringing together scientists. Uh, and also done various films. That, we did some films for the Royal Tutorial Project that Michael Rutland set up as well. So again, trying to get ideas of geology and seismology into, uh, uh, you know, to get discussed and to get debated in, in Bhutan as well. So here we have an issue about the seismic uncertainty. I mean, there have been serious earthquakes. 2009, 2011 had earthquakes in Bhutan, uh, uh, in Monga and in Ha, uh, that they, they were focused. Um, but this key issue is very little evidence of, uh, of this earthquake within living memory. And so some people actually began thinking, is there a seismic gap in Bhutan? Because we've got, and we can see down here, in this, I don't know if you can see in this, the map at the bottom, um, uh, on the bottom right, you can, where you see Bhutan, there's less earthquakes uh, recorded in there. There is a bit just below Bhutan, the Shillong Plateau, where there has been quite a lot of earthquake activity. So some people are saying maybe that's where, as we've got, if people know their sort of seismic uh, uh, um, uh, basics, it's about the two plates coming together. And it's that where the Himalayan, where they meet, is where the earthquakes are going to be. But maybe there's stuff happening in the Shillong Plateau that's then meaning that what's happening in Bhutan might be sheltered. But then we've also found, and this is some of the work done uh, by uh, Kama Funso, working with some uh, other um, seismologists, evidence of a very large earthquake in uh, 1714. Uh, and also, uh, for this project, uh, Kama Funso has, as well has come up with quite a lot of data about other earthquakes in records, particularly the biographies of llamas uh, and other things where people have recorded earthquakes. So we're actually getting a better picture now of actually there is more... Um, um, there are more earthquakes as well. At the moment, a lot of the evidence is reliant on an um, Indian hazard map, which is kind of based on the uh, evidence from the 19 1980s and 1970s as well. So it's a, it's a real need to update that as well, but update it in a way that's done carefully, because you know, uh, wrong information is worse, can be worse than, the, than no information as well. We're also finding that a lot of the earthquake risk is dependent on very localised things as <coughs> areas as well. So going forward, we're looking at how we can have more what they call microzonation, where you can look at the risk might be different within, like for example, the Timpu Valley. They may have different risks based on different sediments and different soils. So they need to look more locally as well. Um, but as I said before, the uh, um, in terms of uncertainty, there was a lot of work going on in the Department of Disaster Management developing disaster management plans. Each Zonka is having uh, um, plans developed, doing, uh, getting preparations done. And so there's been quite a lot of work done on that over the last five years, particularly. Um, but again, still lots more could be done to be learned from that. But also knowing what type of earthquake it might be. Because uh, again, the different types of earthquakes can have quite different effects. But all of this comes down to this idea of uncertainty. We don't really know what, how to cope with uncertainty in any, in any country, but we're particularly interested in, in Bhutan. Is there a, a particular Bhutanese way of understanding uncertainty that might be different to other countries as well? So I'll come back to that uh, in the conclusion. So quickly, just the paper we're going to focus on today with uh, Kungo and myself and Francis Harris is about this sort of more the social science. 
We're doing interviews with um, uh, multiple viewpoints, people across the country, with officials, with businesses, with farmers, religious bodies, civil society, um, uh, reaching out to people both at a national level, but also going officials down to the uh, Zonkag and Gilg. Um, and it's a qualitative study, so it's not a large survey. It's doing in-depth interviews with an, different people. We select them purposefully, so we have a cross-section of different types of people as well. And we collected this over, um, over a one-year period, uh, talking, to, talk, talking to different people as well. We also had workshops with policy makers and scientists. So again, that data is very useful for us as well as understanding uh, how do policy makers relate to the, to the science that's available to them. And then through this, we've analyzed it to draw out some of these, uh, uh, some of these trends. So I can talk briefly about this, sort of the, starting with the sort of the perception of the officials. Um, here we found talking, uh, an interesting thing where the, uh, the perception of the risk varied depending on whether it was a local to a uh, Zonkag or to a national level. With those at a national level, um, with, with, with local officials would often discuss earthquakes assuming a smaller earthquake that they might have. But at a national level, there were more discussion around the consequences of a much larger earthquake and a better understanding of some of the scientific knowledge as well. But a large proportion of people, and it comes back to this issue of people relate it to their personal experience. So at a local level, people would relate it to the earthquake that they might have experienced already. So they may have been involved, uh, uh, some of them had been affected by the Monga earthquake, some by the Ha earthquake, so they could relate it to that. Um, as well, talking at the, at the, uh, particularly at the national level, looking at the, the decision-making around being ready for an earthquake, one of the issues that came up was the real difficulty with making decisions which, with such uncertainty, uh, and you're having to invest in this risk, but the results, you know, would, would they be apparent within a five-year um, election cycle? And whether they, how do you actually justify putting a lot of resource into something when you don't know whether it will be this century or next century or the century after? So it's really difficult political decisions to be made uh, on that front. Um, also, we're finding the, uh, we're looking at one of the key issues is looking at the building codes and the policy around the quality of the buildings. Um, Bhutan is, uh, in, um, is put in a, uh, it takes a lot of its data from the Indian building code and Indian rates everything from uh, zone one to zone five, with five being the most dangerous. And all of Bhutan is put into zone five. So it has the sort of, it's seen as the highest, highest risk. And therefore, it has some of the uh, strongest building um, code for looking, ensuring that any new buildings are built to a high standard with reinforced uh, concrete. And it's the amount of metal you have within the concrete, the, all the regulations around that. Uh, so Bhutan has taken that, that a blanket approach across that, for, particularly for the uh, modern buildings. So we're particularly interested in both the modern buildings, but also we need to look particularly at the traditional buildings, because they, uh, where a large proportion of the people are living in traditional buildings of round earth and rock buildings, so we need to look at more of that as well. So one of the things coming out of our work is how we can feed into uh, uh, um, growing areas of interest on the uh, round earth buildings, how they can be improved, how can they be made more resilient, and there's a number of other projects working on that. But on the other side, we're looking and we're kind of uh, for this high standard of building, but having a high standard of uh, investment in buildings comes at a cost. So people are having to spend a lot of money on their buildings, which comes at an immediate sacrifice in terms of more immediate needs. So again, even um, yeah, at that level, there's some claiming that the building codes are too restrictive and too costly, and that if they're trying to build uh, you know, official buildings, Maybe they have to double the cost because of the, the, the cost of the earthquake resilience. There'll be half the number of buildings. So again, it has some immediate costs and some quite difficult decisions to be made there. And one of the key issues is really then deciding what is the level of risk that can actually help through time. And that's where the interpretation of the hazard maps is quite important. So this is the Indian hazard map 
Um, and as I said before, Bhutan is in the uh, in that zone five, the most um, uh, the highest zone. So all of Bhutan is put into that area. But then there have been some other maps that have also been used. So this is one, another one coming out of in the Indian one um, from uh, Ruki, uh, which kind of gives a lot more detail, but actually it's quite dangerous in that, as I said, if you look at the map on the left, everything is the highest zone. But this, the map in the middle could be interpreted that there are some areas in Bhutan at low risk and some are high risk, when actually it is a cross -board. But it does show that there, are, there could be some areas that are a higher risk. This is the one where the evidence we're not quite sure where, where the data came from, and it looks very slightly over-specific. And this is the, uh, the work that we've done on this, the BRACE project, uh, looking at this probabilistic hazard map, which is looking at those um, having a particular amount of ground movement, uh, having a 10% chance of that being exceeded in 50 years. And this is a, a commonly used approach to actually judge it. So there are differences within, within Bhutan, um, and maybe in the future, the, you know, there's potential for having a more refined um, building codes based on better um, on, on these maps. But again, this is something that is still work in progress. So we're not, you know, we, we definitely uh, wouldn't want policies to be based on this unless there's more work to be done behind it. But there's a big investment through the Department of Geology and Mines looking at uh, looking at that. So I'll talk a bit now about the, um, some of the more the social science and the interviews that we did, looking at the different uh, perceptions. Um, and one of the key issues is this perception uh, around house building. Uh, this is one house, this photo here, that uh, uh, we just did, which is an interesting one in Paro because it has been affected by earthquakes and they've left it to kind of, so it's quite visible while other people have sort of hidden it, hit or, or, or sort of uh, have... Uh, uh, covered the cracks and uh, rebuilt it. But these ones, they, 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 this house, they're debating whether what, what refurbishment they should do to it, but it also gives us a chance. And we can see here that there's a real issue here with the rammed earth buildings. You can see on the, on the building here, on the left hand side, you can see the lines where the, the, between the different sections of the rammed earth. And so we found in our work, we actually spent a lot of time actually really understanding how do you build round earth buildings. What's the, you know, what are the issues there? And one of the issues was the, 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 uh, the breadth of the walls how, and how deep the walls are has changed over time. And also there's some evidence that the uh, amount of ramming on the earth has, de has, has declined as well. And particularly in rural areas, the round earth in the past was a community activity. When someone was building, people would come together, they would ram, they would come to a house, they would help with the building, the ramming of the earth, you, they have the, uh, as they build the walls, they'll build a layer, uh, put wooden battens in, put the earth in and ram it down. And it became quite a social activity, there was food, singing, and it was a communal activity. But as societal changes have occurred over time, there's evidence that there's less that, there's also uh, less, um, a bit of um, depopulation in some areas and a lack of people to do that, and maybe more individualised households. So again, we're finding evidence that maybe some of these traditional approaches may, you know, uh, may not be there. And this was an issue that came up um, that maybe some of the older, you know, some, some knowledge might have been forgotten, some approaches might have been forgotten over time. Um, also, there's an issue regarding different parts of Bhutan, uh, having some areas having stronger uh, structures and other structures as well. So what can we learn, learn from that as well? Um, and again, it comes back to the Bhutanese uh, sort of cultural issue about the importance of having multiple story houses as a sign uh, as the, the people aspire to, as a sign of, uh, of, of, um, of prestige, uh, but also looking at promoting a Bhutanese culture of multi-storey buildings. But also in this, we found in some areas a, a shift to people building in single-storey buildings, which might be more resilient as well. So how do you balance up those, those two as well? Because not wanting, wanting to keep the traditions uh, um, going as well. Um, faith became a very important part of the um, um, 
uh, the work we're doing. We also wanted to look at how do, uh, particularly this is in um, the area, particularly work around Timpu and Ha is where we focused on work, uh, looking at this area. But here we wanted to understand how faith shapes how people perceive the risk of earthquakes and resilience. One of the issue, interesting things was the, uh, the, the stories um, of the origins of earthquakes really emphasize this idea of uncertainty. Um, uh, with uh, a distinction made between how uh, the, um, uh, the predictions of hazards from the sky and climate related hazards might be more, you know, people are, um, are, are, are more willing to sort of discuss that and understand that, but the earth hazards being something that people just say, we don't know about. Uh, there is such uncertainty. And that's, this is um, within the various mythical stories as well. This is reiterated there, so which kind of chimes well with the science uh, that we were looking at. For some, we found that the, uh, the idea of what earthquakes um, is inauspicious, and so people are not willing to talk about it. Um, others, there was a discussion around earthquakes being linked uh, to bad karma, or at a societal level, of, sort of earthquakes maybe relating to that. Um, but also there was discussion um, uh, about how um, good karma, and this is from, um, as in the monastic body we are talking to, how good karma can save someone in a disaster. Uh, so the importance there of uh, linking it to uh, um, uh, the importance of prayer. Um, and that idea of prayer and puja being really important <coughs> in uh, helping people understand the, um, the uncertainty uh, and the importance of faith on that as well. But, so on the one hand we found that side, and some people said all we can do is pray, pray. but also talking to some of the more uh, senior uh, Lamas and Rinpoche, who said, well actually, if we look at our zongs, you know, they were built with preparedness in mind. So, and some of the temples uh, were built very, with very strong foundations. So they are prepared for, for, um, uh, for earthquakes as well. So it's not about just uh, a complete reliance on prayer, it is about doing both as well. Um, and um, as well as sort of being prepared through, through that building, the, the other issue that came up was the role of the faith leaders in um, being prepared for an earthquake, but also uh, shaping the um, everyday understandings. And I think this is where uh, there's a kind of discussion going on, and maybe this is where there could be more dialogue of how, how does the monastic body relate to some of the earthquake science and how does the earthquake scientists relate to the, to, to the, the issues of faith as well. Um, but even in a disaster, the monastic body will play a key role. If there's 800 um, monasteries across the country and many, many thousands of monks, what role do they play? Um, as well as, you know, how can we ensure that they are safe in their historic buildings in case of an earthquake, but then they should be going out to the communities and helping the community as well. So again, there's, an in, uh, there's a particular Bhutanese element here about how do we, yeah, how does Bhutan uh, prepare for an earthquake that might be different to other, other countries. <coughs> um, we looked as well about the businesses um, and how do they make decisions based on uncertainty. Uh, a lot of them uh, were relying on their own experience, but I think here we need to make a distinction, a whole range of different types of businesses. And, uh, as of myself as a researcher of business, I would include in this idea of businesses, everyone including a farmer, uh, building a terrace, building a house, you know, getting food to market. They are, a they are a crucial part of the business community in Bhutan. So how do, they, how do farmers in remote areas uh, prepare for um, earthquakes? And there it's very much around the infrastructure. How do we ensure that resources can get into rural areas? And if there is a damage, if they've got crops and they want to get them out and they're, they're trying to sell some of those crops uh, beyond their subsistence needs, how do they get them to market after an earthquake? Because after an earthquake, we expect there to be very large damage to uh, roads, through landslides, but how do we actually understand that better? How do we uh, ensure there are different ways of getting, getting the food out? Um, also, there's a whole role for business in recovery um, and rebuilding as well, and also businesses involved in uh, deciding um, should they invest 
in uh, resources for you know, that might help dig people out uh, and in case there was a disaster. Uh, businesses also have to decide the quality of their own buildings, how resilient they need to be. Um, if they're building, if they're, uh, uh, if they're building, um, some, building something, how much should they spend on, on it? Should it be multiple storey or single storey? Uh, those sort of investment decisions can, um, you know, can affect the business quite severely if they get it wrong because, you know, will they actually get a return on their investment? And some of them had said, well, if there's an earthquake, you know, we're going to be out of business anyway. So is it worth us investing in, the, uh, in a better building? Uh, while well, others would say, well, actually, no, we need to have a better building because we are a lifeline resource in case of an earthquake. Therefore, we need to have a better building to do that. But again, it's quite a hard decision for individuals to make uh, with limited access to finance and uh, uh, limited resources. The um, telecommunications is a crucial area, as anyone, you know, being in Bhutan in the, you know, will know the widespread use of mobile phones and as a crucial part of, uh, uh, of, of recovery uh, in an earthquake. So the, uh, um, we uh, talking to the uh, telecommunication, the two mobile phone providers, uh, was an interesting area to understand how they see it, how they try to sort of prepare their resilience, how they have um, uh, better ways of backing up what they're doing, ensuring that they may stay online. Um, whether they can actually find ways of, uh, uh, if some of the network is down, how can that be made more resilient? And again, it's with only two providers, there's some, some, you know, some risks for Bhutan as well that way. Um, and the insurance companies, I mean, the, uh, uh, they're a crucial part in this as well, particularly in the recovery. Uh, so I won't go into too much detail here, but. There again, how they interpret the data is that they just say there is one, the Himalayan zone <laughs> is treated as one zone. Um, so again, there's very limited data they've got from past experience, but more could be done there. Maybe things are underinsured, and maybe other things are overinsured. And so again, that might affect you know, different households in Bhutan. Um, uh, but also, there's uh, um, particularly uh, different types of buildings, maybe should have different, you know, can have different premiums. But, it could be there's a demand from the insurance companies for more information so they can make better decisions and offer a better service as well. And then, of course, there is a the huge issue of the hydropower uh, as well, uh, which we just touched on, but they're very much relying on the reinsurance uh, at an international level um, and Indian guidelines as well. But there's a big political issue there uh, of understanding um, you know, what might happen there with huge implications uh, for, the, for the country. So that's the work we did. So to draw conclusions, and that comes back to this two issues that I think are quite relevant for the conference we're here today. One is the need to bring together different disciplines as well. And as well as that, both the specialist, um, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, the more academic knowledge that we might have in this project on the left-hand side, the geologists, civil engineers, communications, health, uh, urban planners, and then also the generalists, and the sort of the people you know, who are living everyday lives. How do we bring that together? And that's this idea we have about negotiating resilience. Uh, and that's why in Bhutan, we're in an interesting um, position because I think Bhutan has a benefit of being a small country. So it has better ways of communication within the uh, officials, but at the same time, that's a, a liability of smallness as well in that you don't have the resource to invest in your own building code or your own hazard maps as well. So should Bhutan invest resource in that or rely on the Indian uh, um, uh, the, the data coming out of the, uh, and the, the, pre the, the, the good the, um, the manuals and the sort of building code from India? So again, it's a, it's a difficult decision to be made there. But the other thing we found in Bhutan is this idea, and I think maybe it's only when you look at other countries you realize that how Bhutan is much better at integrating a number of different perspectives together. Um, and that's whether you have it through things like gross national happiness or the, the, the four pillars that bring, bring together the livelihoods, the environment, the culture, and good governance. is an example of bringing multiple dimensions together. 
And maybe in Bhutan, people are more comfortable with that, while in other countries, people are very specialised in one area. So talking to our seismologists in Bhutan, they really had an understanding of cultural issues, they had an understanding of engineering, they had a, this wide understanding, which you might not find in other countries where people have overly specialised. So I think there might be something there around a, 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 a way of thinking that, that, that's really helped that. And that's where we can maybe learn from Bhutan in how do we bring ideas together, how do we bring ideas of faith with science together um, in a way that might be happening uh, much be easier to happen in, uh, in Bhutan as well. Um, how do we also look at diversity of, um, of different understandings, but also looking at diversity of tr traditional building types, uh, recognising as well that uh, some are more resilient than others, um, recognising as well that we need to sort of protect what's there already, uh, and what sort of um, retrofitting is needed. Uh, and then as people are building, how can we ensure that good practice is there? And generally, it was found that a lot of the building code was, uh, um, we didn't do a big assessment, but from talking to a wide range of people, there was a lot of respect for the enforcement of the building code compared to other countries. And one of the big issues in the Nepalese earthquake was the very poor uh, uh, enforcement of building regulations, while in Bhutan people said it was relatively uh, much, uh, much better. But there are still examples of poorer practice where people are, uh, might be building things which are, um, uh, are, not, so, are not, not so safe. But uh, I think generally looking at it, and the view of the um, engineers and seismologists was that the, um, uh, the buildings in Bhutan um, are, you know, would be safe to be in. Um, and the, that the way they're built, multiple storey buildings are built to a high standard that would keep people safe. Um, then also looking at this idea of um, multiple dimensions as well, we also looked at how do the indicators of gross national happiness relate to uh, earthquake resilience as well. And that's where we want to take it forward by looking at the whole range of different indicators of what the impact of an earthquake might be and relate that back. In many countries they just look at what's the economic impact, the impact of GDP on the earthquake. But actually, Bhutan is in a position to actually have a much more nuanced and more detailed approach where they can actually look at a whole range of indicators um, that can then affect when they have a uh, resilience policy, can be more uh, holistic and more wide ranging as well. So I think there's just interesting things to happen there. And finally, it's a, you know, this project that we've done, it is only a you know, start, but it's shown the ways of bringing together sort of the Bhutanese and international expertise. Uh, the links that have been made, which I think have been really important sort of going forward as well.